Hello, everyone. Welcome to the CTO Innovation Forum, the wireless trend session. Let's give it just uh, one or two minutes. I see uh, the attendees are now starting to join. So let's just wait uh, a little bit and then we'll get started. Hey, so uh, welcome again, everyone. So uh, it's uh, great to have you joining today's Innovation Forum by the CTO Group. Uh, so the mission of this group is available on both the, the website and some of the assets you have received. Uh, so with no further ado, I would just jump straight into the agenda. So we'll have a welcome note by the, the chair of the CTO Group and also the WBA CEO. Then today, we decided to move into a leadership panel uh, on these future wireless trends. Uh, we welcome participation from the audience, so feel free just to uh, flag on the chat if you would like to intervene. Uh, then we'll just do a sneak peek on the 2024 WBA roadmap that we are going to launch very, very soon. And then just the next step, so now you can get involved with this forum. Um, so with this, let's move uh, on to uh, Derek and Tiago to please welcome the, the audience to this uh, end of year session. Yeah, thank Great you, Bruno. You. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, so hi, everyone. So I'm Tiago Rodriguez, the, the CEO of the Wireless Broadband Alliance. Uh, glad to have this session with all of you uh, under the umbrella of the CTO group uh, that Dr. Derek Patterson, together with uh, Dr. Najat Trizampolad, they, they co-lead and with uh, Matt McPherson from, from Cisco. Um, today, uh, session is all about uh, a piece of research that was done uh, uh, under the umbrella of WBI. That is our annual industry report, uh, and under that research, we identify the series of predictions uh, for the Wi-Fi industry, and we'll go over that. Um, and with this, I will hand over to, to Dr. Derek Patterson to welcome you as well. Derek. Thank you, Tiago. Hey, everyone. It's great to be here with you. You know, we try to put these uh, innovation forums together so we can get a conversation going and really just kind of get a bunch of CTOs and leaders of their companies together to kind of think through how we can make the WBA better, but also how we can evolve um, in our companies and with the WBA together and what's happening in the wireless industry. So we've got a really good uh, year coming up with 2024. A lot of uh, activities going on that we're going to talk about. Hope to have all of you along for the ride. It's going to be a very exciting, I think, year in 2024, whether it's what's going on in the industry, what's going on around the world, or what's going on in wireless. There's just so much happening. So with that, I, I, I did. I wanted to sit there and give a shout out to Matt here that's on here today. He's our CTO of the year for the WBA. So he won that this year. So shout out to him and we'll be hearing from him as well as me and Najati today um, as we start going through some of these trends. So with that, I'll hand it back over to you, Tiago, and let's get going. Yeah, thank you, Derek. Uh, yeah, and over to you, Bruno, uh, so we can kick off the, the panel. I believe he's muted. Thanks, Matt. So yeah, I was just going to mention that we'll delve onto these trends. Uh, for those of you that have just joined, uh, the main purpose of uh, this discussion will be to feed into the WBA's 2024 roadmap 
and we start very early. So as early as Q1 working sessions, we start incubating projects for the following year. That's why even though the trends you just uh, saw being communicated to the industry, they are for 2024, it's really important that we take you know, a broader lenses and we can really understand what are the opportunities, the, the challenges and the risks. So we cater the Bay roadmap um, towards those, those trends. So we managed to group uh, these trends into four clusters to make it easier really to analyze them and come up eventually with a report out of this exercise that we want to share with the WB members and the industry and have more input. So the first cluster is around the wireless generation's evolution and also the synergies that are needed with fixed networks. So this includes the evolution to 10 gigabit speeds, Wi-Fi 7 becoming widely available, AFC 60 hertz and the appetite for outdoor deployments. The second bucket is around the new network management paradigms. So a trend that was marked is network as a service, so likely to rise beyond early adopters. Also open Wi-Fi proliferation in some geographies. And then more on the, the other layers, we still see uh, open rooming and conversions being top of mind. So we have been tracking the growth of open rooming and also uh, the likelihood of extending to more technologies. Then conversions to enable access to private or public 5G services over Wi-Fi has been, again, referenced in pretty much all the industry forums and by the different stakeholders. And last but not least, the disruptive services. So. Um, we focus on, on bandwidth, on data, but these type of enhancements can really push the boundaries of where we are seeing the technology evolving. So things like role of AI and ML, uh, augmented and virtual reality to become effective in most deployments, and then new IoT technologies that can also unify connectivity across multiple home devices. So there are 10 in four clusters. We have some work to do to really try and morph them into the WBA activities and, and spread the word on that front. So gathering with the leadership team and uh, opening here the panel, so we decided uh, really to find a way that we could take, uh, you know, takeaways uh, from, from the trend. So really, let's talk a bit about the opportunities, what is really pushing the trend on that sense, but at the same time, if there are risks or barriers that we need to overcome, that can be pushed into the scope of the work of, of the WBA. So for the first cluster, the wireless generations evolution and fixed network strategies, um, I think we can go here around, around the table and have a first round. We also have this market here that is the trend status. So we don't plan to just say, well, this trend is going to succeed. Uh, and then just have that conclusion. But along the year, as this will be a, an exercise we plan to revisit, will be interesting for us to see how this evolves. And as we build up on this report, we can just provide uh, more, more accurate updates. But yeah, maybe uh, for the first trend, the 10 gigabit speeds to become commonplace, well, the gigabit experience we have been hearing for a long time, um, would you guys just like to, to start by sharing where you are seeing this trend evolving, if this opportunity is really going to drive the upgrade on home Wi-Fi networks, and at the same time, how can we cater to developing markets uh, to cope with developed markets that typically move first? So who would like to start? Well, Tiago, maybe I'll jump in. You know, it's, uh, uh, it, I think it's just uh, par for the course as we go into next generation technologies that the speeds get faster and faster. You know, the two areas of bottleneck that we've always had has been the air interface and the backhaul or your wide area connection. And so as we see these, these next generation speeds start to come available, uh, I, I really just think it takes us to the next level. But what I will say is this, I, I think, you know, as bandwidth demand goes up, um, it actually gets harder and harder to consume it. And so there's a set of next generation applications I think we'll talk about in Wi-Fi 7 on how that consumption will go. Because it's always amazing to me 
how consumption does go up, even when you think you've you've provided enough speed and bandwidth. But the point I, I think I want to make is as you increase speed, the other attribute that you get is really a latency characteristic, is the ability to better control latency and jitter. And so if you have a lot of bandwidth available, the chances that when you go on that network that you're not going to collide with something else actually goes up. You get on and off the network much faster. And so the overall experience becomes something that's that's just better. Now there's other obvious benefits, um, even with one gig or as you go into the two, the five and even 10, uh, download speeds when you're loading something that's that's massive. You see people that are doing gaming um, they'll often download 50 gig um, for some of these types of, of environments. And so how fast can you download that content? Um, and then the other comment that I would make is what we're seeing is, is that these backhauls are also becoming um, bi-directional. And what I mean by that is um, even in the one gigabit connections, the typical fiber connection is one gig up and um, uh, down. So, a lot of times in your traditional cable infrastructure, you'd have a big pipe down and a skinny pipe up, and you still see a lot of that. But as we start to move to fiber, it becomes bi-directional. And this is going to be really, really key in these next generation applications and services where the devices are pushing more and more content up into the network, whether it be the cameras on your phones, which have become incredibly high resolution, or the next generation of XR services, the uplink is going to be just as important as the down. So this is a big change, and I, I think it's going to change the way we use the internet. Yep, yep, that's a great point, Matt. Thanks. Yeah, I, I was just I was letting uh, Matt chime in first, though, so that's why I was holding back. So you, I was like, "Come on, you got to go first. You're the CTO of the year, <laughs> anyhow." But just teasing you a little bit. Hey, but, uh, you know, I agree uh, with a lot of what you said. I think, you know, that bi-directional is key. It's going to end up changing some of the way we think about networks that we've always thought down. We put in edge systems, you know, to, to speed up the downloads that we have to do. And one of the things that we haven't spent as much time is, is how we manage those, uh, that up uplink and, secure and encrypt and all of that stuff as as well as we're doing the downlink with our firewalls and the way we end up feeding data into the networks. So I think that that's going to be a very interesting thing that I think we're going to talk about probably in one of the other trends that that because uplink becomes just as powerful, the likelihood of uh, security and the changes in the way we firewall really change as well. So it's not you know, firewall at people out. Now it's firewalling back and both both sides, which is going to be very important. Um, so I think that that's going to be uh, a key other thing that we have to think about and, you know, that we're going to be addressing as part of these uh, trends of moving to 10 gigabits. And you can imagine if you can uplink that data, just how fast you can um, steal data now and, and get... Uh, unwanted data from somebody you know i've been recently playing around with i think i'm on my fifth firewall at, at just at my home and i'm blocking somewhere close to 60 percent of traffic and a lot of it's just you know all these iot devices to, uh, ch ch being chatty back and so that's going to be important for us to address um with that so um excited about what's coming with fiber for sure yeah, uh, totally agree. Let me just share a couple thoughts on following Derek. Uh, definitely, the the uplink is becoming super important. Uh, we saw from work from home, remote workers, the need, uh, especially after COVID, the need of uh, all of us staying at home and working from home, the, the need of um, uploading video and attending all these meetings and sessions. And even, for example, my family having my kids having classes and all that remote. So put a lot of pressure on, on that uh, uplink. Uh, but one thing that I, I really want to discuss is 
we really need to pay attention that we avoid that the wireless link in particular Wi-Fi becomes the weak point or the weak element on this connectivity chain. So uh, like you said, Matt, traditionally there are two weak points. One is the radio link. The other one is the backhaul. Uh, if the backhaul starts to move faster than the radio link, then we start to have a problem on, on the Wi-Fi. And, and that's why I'm, I'm super supportive of having the six gigahertz spectrum to Wi-Fi and more spectrum and AFC, Wi-Fi 7, everything that can push the capacity of the Wi-Fi uh, as much as possible to to follow the trend on, on the, the backhaul. You know, one thing, just tying the two together, because uh, Derek mentioned security. Um, one of the things that really came out, I think, of COVID, uh, was just how important zero trust was. And so what happened, I know at Cisco and a lot of enterprises is that instead of doing your VPN back into your VPN concentrator, back into corporate, and then going out the firewall so that you could apply security policy, the enterprise, of course, wants to apply security policy for their employees, um, that actually caused a bottleneck. And so you were hitting the internet twice um, and then you were governed by the speed of actually your company's connection, not just your yeah. connection. And oftentimes today, you almost see the connection at home offering you more than it when you're sitting at work. And so what Zero Trust did is it allowed you to connect directly into that cloud service. And so there was this huge migration that, that happened. Um, so that benefits us when it comes to the overall latency and, and jitter problem, the experience and what we're doing right now using a multimedia communication tool like this um, is much better if you're not doing that hairpinning. So Zero Trust, big, it secures our connectivity and it distributes that connectivity so that we can do direct cloud user experience. Yeah, and, and let me just add one thing, Matt, uh, and bring a new topic here to the discussion. I think there is a huge opportunity for the carriers to push for an hybrid offer uh, to residential broadband where part of that connectivity is provided by the enterprise or funded by the enterprise and the other one by the, uh, the individual. And, and like you said, so the enterprise started to co-funded the, the broadband uh, at our houses, our companies, I think can open up a lot of opportunities. And I think the carriers can explore that opportunity by raising ARPUs. The enterprise at the same time can provide uh, better capabilities to their employees to work from home. So I think there is a almost a win-win uh, equation there that I'd like to see more explored in the future. Yeah, I think you're opening up a whole another discussion with that comment, Tiago, because if you're, <laughs> I mean, what you really want to be able to do is to segment the home. I mean, the home is interesting, right? Sometimes people think of the home as a small office. It's not. Yeah. Um, when you have a small office, that small office is owned by that particular company and they can push whatever policy they want there. When you're at home, you know, your wife works someplace, you work someplace, um, you may have kids that are in college or are also working someplace. And so you have these different policies that you would want to have implemented onto that service, not the least of which is the ability to secure that connectivity. And, you know, when I go into a cloud service, say, for example, um, I'm using um, Google Cloud. If I go into Google Cloud as a Cisco employee, I'm going to have a different experience than if I go into Google Cloud as, as um, a, a personal um, cloud service. So my personal and my work is going to be different and the policy between personal work is also going to be different. And so that's a major trend that I think Tiago, we're also seeing is how do we provide um, these contextual experiences on these access networks that have to apply policy based on that context. So this, this whole idea of identity driving what, you know, really policy, what does policy include? Policy yeah. includes security, quality of service, and now I think uh, even privacy, privacy in the enterprise context, uh, keeping enterprise data private. So this is this is a whole nother area as we start talking about um, hybrid office type environments that networks need to do. 
Yeah, so maybe uh, I think Matt and, and um, Derek Tiago, I think you just outlined lots of requirements um, that we need now with this trend to take into consideration when we go and, and do trials, right? And we come up with test plans that are more functional towards achieving the end game. And, and maybe with that in mind, if we just talk a bit about here, the Wi-Fi 7 becoming widely available and, and, and the Jati that leads the Wi-Fi 7 group in the WBA, um, maybe Najati, I could ask you if do you believe we need to evolve the scope of the trials we do to include some of these considerations? And um, what do you think? Yes, and basically we are uh, looking at the opportunities and as far as the uh, challenges uh, delivering this uh, more than gig uh, experience throughout the. Uh, homes or enterprises where Wi-Fi should not be a bottleneck. Now, looking at the experiences, um, it is great to have this, you know, 5 gig or 1 gig or gig or 10 gig uh, backend connectivity, but challenge for us becomes how do we deliver, deliver that experience throughout the, all the rooms and every places where users want, want to move around and experience. Now, uh, we, with Wi-Fi 7, certainly it's going to help us with 320 megahertz channels, you know, in uh, some certain cases. But soon, you know, we are going to run to this uh, speed bump or the spectrum issues, specifically in some geographies where we won't be able to get to that point. That's the reality. Uh, that that has to be that awareness, especially when we have these spectrum discussions. That where do you want to basically, you know, go with this thing? Yes, you can deliver ten gig, you know, uh, back how to 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 residential or offices in other places, but without the spectrum, we are going to face challenges. In the US, you know, we have 1200 megahertz, you know, you know band, bandwidth available with six gigahertz, but in many other places, we have only 500. Well, basically, it just limits us at the most, you know, 160 megahertz channels, then the channel capacity is going to be basically as good luck with it, because, you know, we are not going to deploy the networks over there with 300 megahertz channels in many places then how much of that experience you, you can enable and deliver. So with the Wi-Fi 7 trials that we are starting, we are going to specifically look at over there, how do we really, you know, and how far we can get close to this, uh, this multi-gig experience uh, in real life deployments and real life application, uh, so that uh, we minimize the bottleneck of this uh, Wi-Fi in the, in the whole, all scenarios. In the past, it was much easier for us, especially when we were working on, you know, generation Wi-Fi 4 and Wi-Fi 5. Typically, the bottleneck would be the would be the backhaul because the backhaul would be we would have 50 megahertz and megabit per second in you know, a connection to home, uh, like in my case many years ago, and then you know we just bumped it up to 100 and then 200 and 300. Now it is just amazing that we have this you no know, back backhaul issue in many places. Then now you know, you know, we are becoming the bottleneck. The industry is, of course, is you know becoming aware and sensitive. And there are you know, and not, and not only the spectral part, but with the technology evolution you know, as you have over here with Wi-Fi seven and to be deployed, and then we are discussing with the Wi-Fi eight. You know, coordinated multi-AP you know, connection and increasing the efficiency and, and beyond. And there is also discussion taking place around what you want to do with the, you know, this uh, millimeter wave for Wi-Fi. That work is also to take place. And when you put the technology evolution in the pipeline, yes, you know, you know we are going to be able to get to that you know, 10, 10 gig. But uh, still, you know, we need to make the sure that uh, there is awareness with the spectrum is globally available so that we can deliver these capabilities. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, thanks. Uh, 
Uh, I'll just chime in. You know, I think prior to Wi-Fi 6 and 7 and 8, we always were just best effort. We were the best effort network to technology. And that's changed now. It's no longer Wi-Fi is a best effort technology. It's critical. And I think that that's important when you look at this Wi-Fi 7 becoming widely available and what you wrote as the opportunity is to create these experiences and this these net zero latency and re, uh, all these things that you're talking about here, these opportunities, they're ours now to be able to think about because we no longer best efforts. I remember I was sitting in one of the meetings recently and somebody goes, Wi-Fi is supposed to be best effort. That's the way it was designed. And I was like, no, that's, that's not where we want to go with Wi-Fi 7 and Wi-Fi 8. We don't want to be best effort anymore. We want to think about the all the connected devices and connected people and be able to create Wi-Fi to be able to service all of them and service them in the right way. And so things like puncturing that we're doing where you can have a very large channel, right? But then if you're not utilizing the channel, we can puncture and be able to provide other services along that in that frequencies or that spectrum that's not being used. To me, that's the big, huge difference with Wi-Fi 7 and 8. And, you know, the risk, you know, we talk about is, and I like the way you, you worded it there, where you say, Wi-Fi 8, is it really going to make an impact on the enterprise? And the reality is, is it has to. Because we're we're trying to do is we're trying to make it actually be smart instead of best effort. And so it will have an impact because our enterprises are going to start connecting everything instead of saying, ah, let's not connect these things and make them available. We're we're going into stadiums, we're going into enterprises, we're going into venues, and we're thinking through all the experiences. I'm headed to the sphere. Uh to go watch you too. I, I thought it was going to be the last show. So it was Saturday. They added a bunch of others, but I've talked to a lot of people who've been there and I, you know, and we're helping manage that thing. Now, everything's connected. You're making, you're using smell along with visuals, along with mute sound all at the same time, trying to create an event. We used to not do that. It was, they were very separate. And now every venue has to do that. They have to be thinking about that immersive experience, which requires us to stop thinking of Wi-Fi as best effort. And that's, to me, the big the big trend um, for Wi-Fi 7 and forward. No, thanks, uh, Derek. And uh, I think, Matt, Tiago, enterprise, real impact on enterprise, because Wi-Fi 7, so far, as Anjati pointed out, it will start with home residential. But what's your take on this one? Yeah, I think this is an important question because a lot of times what we hear is, is that Wi-Fi 7 is really about the device and it doesn't really have any enterprise applicability. And uh, I would I would challenge that notion. Uh, I think there's multiple different services that are very relevant in the enterprise space. Um, when you talk about enterprise, you're, you're, it's different from home, obviously, right? Because now you're talking about hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of APs. Uh, Derek just talked about stadium environments. Uh, much of our work environment is very open, and so there's the, a lot of chance for interference. Um, and so you have to be able to mitigate that interference. So this next generation of what I would call deterministic type capabilities where you can bound latency even under high density, this is easier to facilitate as we go into Wi-Fi 7. I, I think we got some of it. Um, and Wi-Fi 6 with the ability to schedule from the network. We got more when we began, you know, with 6E as we started to protect um, from interference by allocating more spectrum. Um, but even as you do that, you do need these other capabilities. You know, we talked a little bit about OBSS interference and uh, Derek was, was talking about the ability to puncture. You know, some of the reasons that we use lower channel widths when we do our radio resource management planning is because we're trying to avoid interference with ourselves and, and potentially even uh, with others that might be lighting up an unlicensed radio in your environment or at least around you. Um, if we have the ability to go into wider channels because now we can puncture 
um, we really get the most, uh, the best of both worlds and we get the best utilization uh, of that spectrum. Um, it, it's hard to think of puncturing as an efficiency, but it is an efficiency um, when it, it comes to using the most spectrum um, with the least likelihood of having interference and doing that with high reliability. As we go into Wi-Fi 7 and we see technologies um, like, for example, SES, the Stream Classification Service, what that means is, is that there's a coordination between the device and the network in how it should be scheduled in order to produce the best experience for the applications that it's running. You know, we started some of this technology um, really pre-standard with Apple. We called it Fastlane Plus, where the device could tell us what it needed and then we would schedule it accordingly. And now we've standardized that into SCS. You know, that ability to know what a device needs means that your overall scheduling algorithm can be improved. Now, if you take that, if you take what the device wants per application, and then you take the policy in an enterprise network where the enterprise network says, hey, these services and applications are mission critical to us. For example, a hospital, the communication into medical equipment, doctor paging and nurse paging systems, that might be mission critical. So you can take into account both the application needs and you can take into account the policy of the venue for the traffic you're passing. You put that together and you're gonna produce a much better environment and that's an enterprise environment. So Wi-Fi 7 is the next step for those building blocks to improve not just, um, I would say the device's capability, but the overall network capability to do things intelligently for the best experience, lowest latency and best throughput. Yeah. Well, thanks, Matt. That's yeah, in, in, in light of that discussion, basically, there's, uh, we are focusing on Wi-Fi 7 and others, and though we, we mentioned a couple of things about the, you know, uh, related item to quality of services, uh, and we have been actually working on the quality of services uh, within Wi-Fi lines with the QS management release 1 and release 2 and release 3. We started with the initial work with the QS management, you know, the, the, the prior to base QS, basically you could only tag the package saying that this is only, you know, voice, video, uh, best of our kind of categories that, uh, you know, was released about four years ago or so. And then we said, what is next? We need to basically look into uh, capabilities for, for policy which uh, Matt would have mentioned in the case of enterprise, where the enterprise should be able to tell the device and I have a policy for this thing, that then you can connect that policy with the, uh, the, the mapping and other existing categories and et cetera, uh, based on the application, based on the user and based on all that stuff too. So capability, capabilities are coming you know, in place. and. Currently, we are working on the QS management release three. That is, as again, Matt mentioned, SCS plus uh, QS characteristics, where now we can exactly schedule the flows, but, you know, per flows, saying that I need, you know, for this, my, uh, for, for my connection, uh, X millisecond to 40 milliseconds, so that the AP is going to come back and come back to stay every 40 milliseconds for turning the transmit opportunities where the, uh, the client over there would be able to transmit the packets every 40 milliseconds. Here we basically are being in the, you know, this um, you know, more deterministic behavior into the Wi-Fi versus to being Wi-Fi best of all. So all the pieces, you know, in the technology evol uh, you know, evolution within Wi-Fi domain is you know coming together well and also we are looking at the you know other aspect of the you know wi-fi where basically when you have uh, uh multi-radio devices like the, the the 5g and as well as wi-fi now we want to you know go from 5g to wi-fi or wi-fi to 5g how can you really enable the experiences so that the flow or user experience is not going to you know, get, get a hit because you are moving to Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi you know, quality of services you know, are not you know, at par with 5G. That work also is you know, within the you know, work of the Wi-Fi lines, mapping the 5G QS to Wi-Fi so that then you know, the flow is brought to Wi-Fi 
we are going to be able to pretty much you know, within the Wi-Fi domain enable similar kind of 5G QS capability within Wi-Fi. So this interesting evolution is taking place with all these pieces in, in terms of the QS work in, within Wi-Fi Alliance as well as IEEE. So thanks, Najati. And I just took a note here on our uh, convergence trend. This will be an interesting one also to blend there. Um, but allow me uh, to open also for a few questions from the audience. I think we have um, at least uh, at least one. So let me check if uh, Peter is uh, in a position to intervene. Needs to unmute himself, Peter. Thank you. Perfect. Must be a must be a fat finger there. Um... Bruno, I didn't have a question. No, not a problem. But I know lots of lots of work on on that front as well. But yeah, just a reminder that if anyone would like to intervene, just raise your hand, and we will be able to bring you on stage. Okay, Nijat. Yes, yeah, thanks. I think you just provided here some blend on you know Wi-Fi seven and how we are seeing things evolving and the work that needs to be done. We just had here one more risk that it's, of course, Wi-Fi 8. So I personally have started to see some you know, communication about Wi-Fi 8. The work is going to continue. But does the panel have an opinion on how this plays with you know, Wi-Fi 7 now becoming available and uh, what this means right, for us as an industry, the shorten of the cycles? You know, I would, you know, I, I, you know just one more comment about um, Wi-Fi Seven. I, I I think we would we would be amiss if we didn't mention MLO or uh, MLD when we're talking about Wi-Fi Seven. I think it's the first topic that comes to mind uh, when we talk about next generation technology. So this multi-link operation, multi-link device, uh, I think it's going to be extremely key. I mean, we get several different benefits. You know, we, it's re it gives us better reliability. It, it improves our band load balancing, um, for example. Um, lower latency, potentially higher throughput, uh, more efficient use of the spectrum uh, itself. Um, so I think this is going to be a very important technology, and I think we're just learning all the different ways that we can really apply it. It does require a lot of intelligence, and so it's it's a feature or it's a building block that's afforded us uh, when we do uh, Wi-Fi 7, um, but I think it's going to take some time for uh, the work on on devices and the networks themselves to to leverage it to full benefit, but I did want to mention that's an extremely powerful feature, um, and we expect that that will continue to grow. If you look at Wi-Fi eight, um, MLO takes on some new characteristics and possibilities. Right now, when we talk about multi-link operation, we typically talk about it in the context of multiple pieces of spectrum connecting um, simultaneously uh, into a single device into a single AP. Um, and that has some some significant benefits. But when we get into Wi-Fi 8, we start talking about multi-AP coordination um, and we talk about mo mobility because when, when we manage latency, um, when we do what we call bounding the latency um, for some of these next generation services and applications, what we want to make sure is that we don't only do that when the device is sitting still. Um, right now, I'm plugged into a laptop and I'm talking to you and the device is sitting still. And because of that, it can achieve a certain characteristic and its connectivity into the network. As soon as that device starts moving, that, that RF characteristic changes. And uh, you want to be able to make sure as devices move and as you're moving around an office environment or a robot is moving around a factory environment that you can maintain the latency characteristic and gender. Um, and to do that, um, you might actually be able to, to take uh, advantage of some of the MLO functionality by allowing you to connect simultaneously using different spectrum into two different APs. And so there's a lot of things that are being discussed around uh, Wi-Fi 8 and the functionality that we would do there. Um, it has been dubbed ultra-reliable. Um, MLO is, I think, the first step uh, to achieving reliability. But uh, to call wireless ultra-reliable um, is... You know, if, if you've been working in wireless, I might be considered a bit of an oxymoron because <laughs> wireless, you know, can always be interfered with. Um, but it is getting to that point, um, not just in 5G, uh, but also in unlicensed environments, which is a huge step forward. So this progression, Wi-Fi 6 scheduling, Wi-Fi 6E spectrum, um, 
the ability in Wi-Fi 7, um, MLO, and uh, the ability to bound latency in high-density environments, and then Wi-Fi 8, ultra-reliable, um, you can kind of see where this is going. I think Derek mentioned it before. Um, we're going to get a, a much better predictable experience, even with the growing density that we're seeing in networks, even with the advent of IoT that's going on around us. Yeah, I'll just add to that and I'll throw on my little futuristic hat. You know, one of the things that I've always thought of, you know, when when we start having these speeds and we're talking about Wi-Fi 7 and we're talking about, you know, things being more uh, than best effort, then we you, you brought up something about now we've got to worry about, you know, coordination amongst multiple frequencies, multiple access points, multiple different technologies, but then also the security associated with that about how they it has to be really reliable or and we don't want people to interfere. So I think eventually you get into some kind of algorithms that AI brings in and all these different technologies where we can do more frequency hopping kind of technology. So now that ends up adding a second layer to security, right? Because we've now been able to have this multiple link operations. We've been able to have multiple connections for the multiple devices, but then the security ends up up in their game too and says, well, I could just start blocking, right? And I'm going to find new ways to block or, or get inside that uh, and steal information. And so encryption is one method that we use today, but you know, eventually the encryptions are going to be able to be broken because these systems are faster, more connectivity, everything else. So then you start getting into me. What I think is the future is also some frequency hopping from a security perspective, which leads us into Wi-Fi 9 and some of those other things. So, you know, you kind of look at this trend and you see where we're going and it just keeps going along and it's it's exciting stuff. So anyhow, um, that's just something else for us to think about. Get us to our next topic, Bruno. We're we are I don't think we're gonna get through everything today, yeah, but I think we, we have no time to <laughs> yeah. cover everything. I think that was the the expectation that this is a guide yeah. to of the trends. So of course you read the trend, but if you look into this session definitely the all the food for thought is what help us build the programs. But still I think we have time uh, to cover the, the 6 gigahertz uh, AFC that builds on, on top of everything we, we have been discussing. So I think there are two angles. One is, of course, uh, the, the, the indoor the, that we have been, of course, trialing and using already uh, with, some, with some impact. I think this trend is more about does the AFC as the the power to create outdoor AFC services, for instance, if this country is opening large chunks of 60 Hertz spectrum, so the full, you know, 1200, can we see operators just providing new wireless ISPs that can leverage these as a new way of providing connectivity? And at the same time, you know, the trend also mentions that rural connectivity is the one likely to succeed first. And what about the others? So let me get your thoughts on, on these two different yeah. angles. Uh, Bruno, the 6 gigahertz is a super important topic, especially this week that is happening, the ITU, WRC meetings in Dubai, uh, and and uh, the different countries' delegation will make big decisions on this topic. Uh, I wanted to bring an angle on, on the, the 6 gigahertz that is more broad than, than just the 6 gigahertz. I believe the trend is, as spectrum is limited, we need to, for the future and bring more uh, uh, visionary uh, perspective, the, the shared spectrum must be something that is going to happen and across different bands. And of course, now is arriving to Wi-Fi, but uh, the shared spectrum is a key element to bring that uh, immersive experience uh, that Derek was talking about, that how can we have uh, all these technologies talking to each other, optimize uh, the resources available in this precise location for whatever type of uh, content services that we need to deploy. And uh, this requires uh, uh, new skills, 
uh, new mechanisms, new processes to make sure that that rare uh, spectrum can be shared depending on exactly location and services that we want to, to develop. Uh, for the Wi-Fi, I, regardless of whatever WRC decides and the politicians decides in Dubai, in the WRC, uh, I, I'm very confident that the, the AFC to use the standard power on, on the 6 gigahertz is a fundamental element for, for the future of Wi-Fi. Uh, and and I'm, I have no doubts that we'll see it uh, across the world. Well said. Yeah, I think, Tiago, I mean, you brought up multiple points that are worth addressing. You know, if you step back for a second, uh, 6 gigahertz was really a different beast, wasn't it? Um, you know, in 2.4 and 5, what we did is we freed up the spectrum. By and large, you know, we had the upper 5, you know, that were potentially some contention. But by and large, we freed up the spectrum. And there's been multiple attempts over over our history to try to use spectrum or to share spectrum. And, uh, you know, a lot of people may not realize we're actually sharing spectrum when we talk about six gigahertz. There's incumbents there. Um, there's point to point links there. <clears throat> there's there's terrestrial to satellite links there. Um, and there's a lot of them. There's hundreds of thousands of them. And even though um, there are a lot of them, if you look at the something the size of the United States, uh, you can still say that that spectrum is available most of the time in most places. And so what we had to do uh, when we started thinking about using 6 gigahertz is we said, look, um, we want to use the 6 gigahertz spectrum. We want that 1200 megahertz. But at the same time, we don't, we don't want to disrupt uh, the incumbent use. Um, and in some sense, they even have first right, um, you know, if, if for no other reason they were there first. And, and so when we did LPI or low power indoor, the intention was to say that, hey, you can operate at this power level and do Wi-Fi just like you did 2.4 and 5. You can use the full 1200 megahertz. Um, you don't have to do anything special and, and it'll work just like you always expected. Um, so very easy. And it was very key to us to make this very easy. Um, but there are some problems, right? Because when, as soon as you start talking about um, building entry or, or exit loss, um, you can you can assume that LPI is not going to interfere with anything external to that building. But if you start th using things like directional antennas, uh, external antennas, where you're beam steering, and what you do when you beam steer is you're actually increasing the power to a specific point, then what happens is that you could over come that building loss and actually inject interference where you didn't intend to. So, so we, we call it AFC, we call it outdoor uh, because outdoor it's assumed you need higher power for a, a bigger radius, but it's going to be used indoor as well. It's going to be used indoor for directional an antennas, for example. Um, there's use cases uh, where you might want to apply this, for example, in your CPE equipment um, for your cable or your fiber provider um, access point, built-in access point, where using slightly higher power could mean reaching the whole house and not needing a mesh implementation, right? And so you're increasing range in those types of circumstances. And so there's multiple different applications when we talk about going to standard power. And of course, there's the other end. And, you know, at, at some point, I don't know if we'll get to the conversation here. Derek was talking about frequency hopping, but it makes me think also of VLP and what's happening with C2C. Um, that's a whole nother um, conversation um, where you might do a personal area network between devices that are on your body. And so I think what we have to do in the industry is to figure out how do we optimize the overall spectrum use um, while not interfering with these different use cases. So LPI, don't interfere with the existing satellite and terrestrial connections. Um, VLP, how do you do it without interfering with the infrastructure implementation? Because it could potentially inject interference that was not predicted and therefore cause an increase in latency you weren't expecting. Um, same thing with frequency hopping. Um, frequency hopping can be a good idea, but it needs to be coordinated. So in this next generation, how do we move towards determinism how do we establish the ability at high density to manage or bound our latency while still facilitating these different power levels and, um, and ability to segment out this spectrum in such a way that everything benefits to the fullest? And so that's I think that's what we're trying to do here. That's what AFC 
is really intended to do. And by the way, the history here wasn't so great. Um, you know, we looked at doing databases for TV white space um, that didn't fly so good, right? Um, we do a similar type functionality with CBRS with the SAS. The SAS is a little bit more sophisticated. Um, but the impact of a SAS on 150 megahertz, um, I'll say it's significant. It's especially important for private 5G. Um, but it's not the same as an ASC that's going to coordinate or allocate six gigahertz spectrum on a tech on an access technology that carries over 90% of our internet traffic. So this is a huge step. Uh, and I think people should just realize the, um, the immensity of this because um, we want this to work. Um, and we put a lot of effort into it at Wind Forum, at WBA, at WFA, um, the Dynamic Spectrum Alliance, um, and working with the FCC and other regulators. So there's an incredible amount of effort going into this. And if we prove this technology, um, which we must do because the demand is that high, then what that means is that other lightly used swaths of spectrum can become available because we've, pro we've proven we can do it. So this is quite strategically important and, um, and it will uh, really get us to that, um, to that next level, I think, in opening up spectrum to meet this higher demand um, and these bounded latency use cases that we know are coming um, right around the corner. Yeah, so Matt, I, I just updated our main uh, risk here. That is, yeah, let's prove the tech and 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 make it work. And you are right; things are much and more, you know, closer from becoming a reality. Well, I think you know this has been quite quite useful. So we have lots of content that we can build into our you know uh, planning. So maybe um, I would propose that uh, this first cluster we just drop up this this initial round um and and for these i will just uh, go over briefly the, the other clusters we are going to review on on the future session so we'll go over the new network management paradigms the open roaming and conversions and then the disruptive services so with these i think we were just to shed a bit on the 2024 uh, roadmap so this is going into the final stages of validation and approval internally in the WBA. But what I would like to highlight is that from the nine new activities that were proposed, most of them are trying to cater to some of the trends. So things like uh, evolving on the infrastructure side, the security topics we have put forward, the policy and regulatory affairs work group, including some 60 Hertz Tiger teams, then you can see also lots of QoS, um, some new ways of enabling uh, identity management across both you know, Wi-Fi and 5G with policy, the open rooming topics. Yeah, so we are uh, very excited by the depth that the members have proposed for us to address next year. Uh, we'll try as much as possible to bring the feedback here from this group uh, into the activities. So on the first sessions of the year, likely in January on our working sessions, uh, these inputs will be brought. So the scope of work will be defined, table of contents, and really what are the priorities for the initial you know, quarters. But yeah, so if you are interested, if you have any feedback uh, towards the roadmap, if you want to get engaged, please contact, contact the WBA and we'll make sure to provide you, you know, a briefing and schedule some individual time uh, to get you onboarded. Uh, in terms of the, the CTO Innovation Forum itself, so uh, a reminder to those of you that have just joined, so there are a few assets that you can leverage. So if you are, as Derek mentioned in the beginning, uh, you have an interest on technology, you drive some roadmaps within your company, we have um, a profile page or, or a booklet online with the, the company representatives for the CTO group in the WBA. We'll be happy to add you. The roadmaps and key trends will be the end game of the exercise you just saw today. So we plan to issue a report, uh, beef, beef up a bit the trends and deliver this roadmap uh, report to the industry. 
the events that we organize for next year, there will be a couple virtual webinars and we are planning a face-to-face -face in Q2 alongside our uh, US Dallas event. Uh, the newsletters, uh, it's something we are also putting forward so the members can come and provide an article about some innovation within the company or the industry. Um, and then, you know, finally, you know, the, the awards and uh, Matt got the, the wireless CTO of the year, but there are other initiatives that we foster uh, when it comes to promoting the work of the WBA. Having said this, we also uh, have the mission or the hat uh, to coordinate some of the industry partnerships and funnel whatever priorities and collaboration with our key industry forums. So again, if you follow uh, an industry association and you believe WBA should be working closely uh, with that you know, vertical or, or have a more tight set of liaison with those organizations, the CTOG is the group that can also help uh, making those, those bridges. And there are meetings scheduled from time to time uh, to really go over the partnerships and decide what is the work plan. The roadmap uh, for next year, I already mentioned the Q1 and Q2 events. Uh, we hope then towards the end of the year also to have um, a flagship event to come up with all the future challenges. Something that this group is really keen is also to bring the verticals. So alongside you know, the history of the group, we managed to involve you know, hospitality, um, automotive, lots of participating brands you can see here that have engaged on these sessions uh, you know, over time. So if uh, there is a vertical that you believe would be benefit from more wireless exchange and, and discussion, this is the right group also to um, facilitate that and, and, and let us know if there's any invitation we should be issuing. Um, and with this, I think uh, I would like to issue a welcome note to our you know, shares and leadership team. So I hope that the session was, was useful. Uh, we'll be sure to share the recording and, and the PowerPoint and wait for the invitation on the next, um, for the next meetings. So with this, I think we can close and uh, thanks everyone for attending. Looking forward for the next ones. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you.